Hey everybody, thank you for watching Leaf by Leaf. Welcome to video two or week two of the five week series for Roberto Bolaño's 2666, AKA the book that is keeping me up at night. This is week two. Uh, so this uh, covers the second part of this five part novel, <clears throat> which is the part about uh, Amalfitano. Really interesting um, switch here. Again, I, I really didn't know anything about 2666 going into it. Um, so I really like uh, that the, the whole story about the critics has kind of been put on hold and now we have uh, gone backwards in the timeline and picked up um, to, to begin to learn more about uh, the Chilean professor there at the University of Santa Teresa named Amalfitano. But before we get into uh, the book proper, I want to talk a little bit about the concept of a masterpiece. Roberto Bolaño, from what I read in uh, his essay and article and speech collection between parentheses, he's, he definitely had his sights on a masterpiece. As Adam Kirsch points out in this uh, slim little book called The Global Novel, Writing the World in the 21st Century, I can't I'm not recommending this. It's it's it is a little pamphlet. Um, there are other things that I found out about this imprint from Columbia University that sort of irk me. Um, but nonetheless, um, he did point out that Bologna in 2666 is sort of offering the opposite of Voltaire's Candide, which was the the best of all possible worlds. This is the worst of all possible worlds. And he says that <clears throat> by insisting that we ourselves inhabit the worst reality, Bologna produces a book that is never simply entertaining and often actively burdensome to read. This thorny ambition is consistent with his open contempt for the notion that a writer's calling is anything but the creation of masterpieces. And he quotes, Bolaño is saying, by now I knew that it was pointless to write, or that it was worth it only if one was prepared to write a masterpiece. Most writers are deluded or playing. This is right in line with uh, The Unquiet Grave by Cyril Connolly. Uh, right in the opening sentence uh, of this one, Cyril Connolly says, the more books we read, the clearer it becomes that the true function of a writer is to produce a masterpiece and that no other task is of any consequence. And then in the book proper, um, towards the end, well, right at the end of this part, um, he is talking, or Amalfitano is talking about this young pharmacist um, who was always reading these minor works of people. It says, he chose the metamorphosis over the trial. He chose Bartleby over Moby Dick. He chose a simple heart over Bouvard and Béchouchet, and a Christmas carol over A Tale of Two Cities, or the Pickwick Papers. What a sad paradox, thought Amalfitano. Now even bookish pharmacists are afraid to take on the great, imperfect, torrential works, books that blaze paths into the unknown. They choose the perfect exercises of the great masters, or what amounts to the same thing. They want to watch the great masters spar, but they have no interest in real combat. When the great masters struggle against that something, that something that terrifies us all, that something that cows us and spurs us on amid blood and mortal wounds and stench, this is a glimpse right there in these those strong words. Um, that is a glimpse at the vision that Bologna had for this book. The plot, like I said, um, Bologna, we, we take a step back in the narrative. We're, we're talking, focusing on the Chilean professor um, who works at the University of Santa Teresa. Um, and it covers the time from when his wife, Lola, became delusional and, and left him and their young daughter, uh, Rosa. Um, she believed that she had uh, an intimate connection with this uh, poet and it covers that time all the way to where Rosa is now uh, a teenager and she and Amalfitano are living together there in Santa Teresa. Lola, Lola the wife, is out of the picture. Um, as with Liz Norton in the uh, part about the critics, um, Amalfitano 
uh, appears to be psychosomatically sensitive um, to the atmosphere of the place. Again, Santa Teresa being um, the fictionalization of Cuidad uh, Juarez, uh, where all the murders are taking place, and we follow him. Of course, Liz flees, but we f we follow him off Fatano as stages of madness set in. This uh, continues the the mood of the first part about the critics where it's becoming more and more this intensification of unease and dread and paranoia um, and this time it personifies or concentrates all of those moods uh, into Amalfitano. Again from Kirsch's The Global Novel it says from the Holocaust in the 1940s to the epidemic of murders of women in the 1990s Mexico <clears throat> Bologna is drawn to times and places where evil comes undeniably to the surface, turning the real world itself into a surreally menacing alternative reality. There's another repetition of um, the, the critics in the first part, their fascination with uh, Edwin Johns, um, the artist who's mutilated himself, um, and they visit him in an asylum in Switzerland, uh, but this time there's an instantiation of this uh, same uh, pairing with Amalfitano's wife, Lola, and, and that obsession with the poet, and she actually goes um, and, and visits him in an asylum. As these things are unfolding with his wife, um, Amalfitano, uh, there's this repeated uh, statement here in close proximity, um, close succession, it says madness, is contagious, thought Amalfitano. And then again, madness really is contagious. And so, you know, indeed, there are many uh, potent madnesses in this novel. Um, and at, at this point, when he thinks that, he's of course thinking about Lola. What we don't realize is that this is a foreshadowing or, or uh, the fact of uh, Lola having that active contagion of madness um, it at least didn't cross my mind that he would uh, succumb as well. Um, and so uh, his proposition here that madness is contagious um, comes to uh, the confirmation of it, comes to fruition later on. His own descent has three different main manifestations. The first one is the mysterious uh, geometry book that appears. Now we just got a glimpse of that book in the previous part. Um, where the critics went to Amalfitano's house and they happened to notice that there was this geometry book uh, clipped up on the clothesline. Uh, this part explains why that is. It's something that, um, you know, this is a very multi-layered symbol. Uh, this object of the geometry book. It's this mysterious book. No one knows where it came from. Uh, it just appeared in his uh, boxes of things that he brought to Mexico. And he gets this idea to copy something that apparently Marcel Duchamp did um, as a wedding present to, I think, his sister, um, where he, you know, Duchamp is famous for his ready-mades. Um, he actually clipped um, a geometry book to uh, some chords. And so part of it is based on that. Another part of it uh, is this deeper symbolism of he, he wants to see um, if the book can withstand uh, nature. So he's bringing, in a sense, he's bringing artifice into nature. So there's um, art and there's naturalism uh, and they're warring it out and he's constantly checking on the book um, to see how it's withstanding uh, nature's indifference to artifice. Uh, another level that it works on is that he is attaching his own uh, psychosomatic stability to the book. It's almost like um, he's checking the, the book almost as like a mood stone. Um, some kind of talisman for his own stability. There's also, again, this is a, a more uh, concrete and physical uh, manifestation of what we get in the first part from Johns in the asylum and, and talking about, um, you know, his friend wanting to, to bring order to chaos. And what is geometry um, other than exactly a, a very uh, ordering of reality. There's also the automatic writings that he does where he just draws signs and writes out names and then looks at them uh, almost sort of like a like a free association type exercise uh, from psychoanalysis or sort of like a Rorschach um, trying to to put things together and notice patterns and we get a lot of interesting names a lot of historians and artists 
and uh, literary critics, um, Alan Bloom, Harold Bloom, even show up in here, um, and uh, many philosophers, of course, uh, Malfitano is, is a, a philosophy teacher, so it makes sense that those names will be on his mind. And then there's, of course, the voice. And I won't get too much uh, into that because it's done so well uh, that I don't want to um, spoil it uh, or taint it. Uh, maybe in the next video I'll harken back to it. Um, but the, the voice is the, is the third and, and, and biggest manifestation uh, of his descent, the murders. Uh, just like the first one, um, you know, in the first part, we just got these oblique glimpses um, at, at this horrible topic that uh, is looming. But now uh, it's coming closer and closer to us. And, you know, it's, it's obviously so prevalent that it's referred to as just the murders. Um, everybody there knows what you're talking about when you say the murders. And why it's still sort of just oblique right now, uh, I've got a couple of thoughts on that. In a way, if you think about it, so far we've only gotten the perspective of people coming from outside of Mexico. So in the first part we've got Beltier and Espinoza. Um, but, you know, Beltier was uh, m more concerned with just sitting around the hotel and reading Ochimboldi and then Espinoza got all caught up in uh, courting Rebecca. So they were, you know, they were consumed with things outside of, of the, the goings on there. And then in the same way, Amalfitano um, is consumed with, of course, his increasing madness. Um, this, these writings, these free associations, these, uh, the, the mysterious uh, geometry book, and then the voice. But like I said, Bologna is bringing us closer and closer uh, to the heart of these horrendous acts that are uh, going on. Uh, and in fact, there's a scene where Amalfitano's daughter uh, is present at a protest um, against the government, um, as demanding more transparency in the investigation of the murders. So I get this feeling that Bologna is easing us as outsiders ourselves into the maw of evil. 